Hello board game brothers and sisters, I'm Adam Singer and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of all the board games launching on Kickstarter and GameFound over the next week. If you're new to the channel, we do this every week going over all the upcoming campaigns, so if you want to stay up to date, this is the best place to be. But if you want to stay even more up to date, definitely go ahead and check out Board Game Co because Alex over at Board Game Co puts out a video at the end of each month going over all the big campaigns that are launching over the next month. And we are nearing the end of the month already, so Alex should have that video up any second and you'll want to subscribe if you want to get notified of that. He also puts up a ton of other really helpful videos including different reviews and deep dives into different campaigns as well as commentary on the industry and any meaningful events that seem to come up over time. Before we jump into the campaigns for this week I do like to go over some new discoveries that I just found out about in the past week and I don't really have too much to cover but I saw that there was a campaign that was just announced over on GameFound and this is for a storage solution and additional accessories to soup up your unmatched card game. Unmatched is a fantastic card battler that has players mixing all sorts of themes and genres together to form their teams and go up against the opposing player. And I know a lot of you that own this game will be excited to know that there is a storage solution coming and that's going to help you with storage as well as transportation if you want to play it anywhere else other than your own home. So I'm just letting you know of this now but I will cover it in more detail on the week that it launches. And that's all I have for new announcements so let's check out the campaigns. And the first campaign we have launches on May 23rd, and this one's called Brand New Zoo, and this plays 1 to 100 players, and what that really means is that it just plays an infinite amount of players. Since all players are doing their actions simultaneously, it doesn't add additional time depending on the player count, so it doesn't really matter how many players you play with, except for maybe the time of ripping out 100 pages from your roll and write pad, because this is a roll and write, and it plays about 20 to 40 minutes to play otherwise. And this is an interesting take on a roll and write because each round two dice are going to be rolled and then all players will be taking their turns simultaneously like I mentioned. But the reason that the roll and write works so well for the zoo theme is because players will be drawing on their sheet creating different pens in order to house different animals and players will be using those dice to draw those enclosures, hire zookeepers, or acquire different animals for their zoo. But if doubles are rolled instead of performing any of those actions players can instead choose to charge admission and that will help them game victory points depending on the different combinations of animals that they have attained for their zoo. All the different animals score in different ways, so you're going to want to take advantage of the different opportunities as they arise, and at the end of the game the player with the most victory points wins the game. And also launching on May 23rd, we have Blaseball the Card Game, and this plays two players, it takes about 20-40 minutes to play, and if you haven't heard of Blaseball, it's not just something that was created for this game, it's actually an internet phenomenon that's been building and growing over the past few years, and it's kind of like fantasy baseball, but it describes itself as a baseball horror game, and it definitely lives up to that, anything can happen in this world of Blaseball, and if you want to know more about it, it's really interesting, you can check out the wiki page to learn more, or you could even go ahead and check out Shadow up and sit down because they put out an excellent video explaining all the nuance of it and some crazy situations that players might find themselves in. And in this two-player head-to-head game, players are going to be acting as coaches to their own baseball teams. They're going to be deciding their pitchers and their batting order, and each coach deck is going to be made up out of 24 cards that they get to build themselves. There's going to be 14 player cards and 10 special cards. On a turn, players are going to be choosing from their cards and putting them face down on the pitching, batting, and outfield areas of the board. And then the coaches will also have options to put those special cards in different areas of the board. And depending on where you put those, they can get triggered at different points in the game to allow you to bend or even break the rules in your favor. After all the cards are put out, the pitching player is going to go first. And that player is going to roll dice, adding any modifiers from their pitcher's card in order to determine the outcome of the roll. And for the batter to actually hit the pitch, they need to roll the die or modify it in different ways to end up with a value that's higher than the pitcher's. And the outfielders can catch the ball, but to do so, they need to roll a value even higher than the batter's value, so this gets progressively harder at each point in the chain. Of course this is Blaseball, so there's going to be a bunch of crazy ways to modify your cards, modify your dice rolls, and just use weird special abilities to buff your totals or cause havoc to the opponent player. And if you are not familiar with Blaseball or even Baseball, it's not going to stop you from enjoying this game because you don't need any prior knowledge. But as soon as the batter gets three strikes, they're out, and as soon as three batters are out, the players are going to swap sides, and then the batting player becomes the pitcher and vice versa. And if the new batting player is able to score a higher value than the previous batting player, then they win the game. 
Otherwise, their opponent wins. And that's all there is to it. And if you're interested in this game or any others, I have links to all the campaigns in the description below. And the next campaign we have launching on May 23rd is an interesting one because this one's actually a solo RPG card game. And in this game, you're going to be playing as one of the last remaining of a group of friends who set out for an adventure in Scandinavia. But one by one, your friends were taken away by a mysterious darkness. The darkness also wants to overtake you and you're going to be desperately clinging on to the memories of those you've loved. These memories are the things that anchor you to the real world and losing out on those is going to bring you more and more into the dark. You'll play the game using candles, a deck of cards, and dice as you fight to remain anchored to the world. Definitely an interesting take on an RPG and if you want to know more I have links in the description below. And the next campaign we have launches on May 24th, and this one's called Arcs. And this plays three to four players and takes about 60 to 90 minutes to play. And this is a campaign that I'm really looking forward to, and I know a lot of you are looking forward to it as well, because this is coming from the designer Cole Worley, who's designed a ton of really excellent games, two of them being in the top 100, which is really incredible for a single designer to have multiple games in the top 100. And of course, the most notable of his games are those two, but he also designed games like Oath, John Company, and Vast Crystal Caverns. And I've actually already owned a few of his games and they're all really excellent games, but I personally did have some pretty big gripes with them that caused me to get rid of them from my collection. So why would I be excited about this game? And the reason for that is because I always tend to have the same issue with his games and that's just that there's too much of a rules overhead and the games often require multiple plays with the same people for players to actually play the game properly without breaking it in some way or making bad decisions that kind of imbalance the game. But once you get to that point, these games are really excellent and offer a lot of depth and strategy. So if you do have a regular play group, these games might be a really great option for you. For myself, I just tend to prefer games that are a little bit more accessible and easier to get to the table. And that's why I'm so interested in this game because Cole Worley is an excellent designer. I just don't feel like he's created a game yet that fits into my own preferences when it comes to board games and the amount of overhead that go along with them. But I did a lot of research on this game. I read through all the designer diaries and the type of game that he's designing this time around is aimed to be quite a lot simpler than the other games that he's designed. Not so simple that he's going completely off the other side, but he's trying to design a game that's about as complicated as the base set of rules for Root if you were to disregard all the additional rules that go with the asymmetrical factions. And he actually goes into a ton of detail explaining the different design challenges that he ran into and the different solutions that he came up with and the reasons for that, which is one of the reasons that this is my pick of the week. Because after reading all that, it got me really hyped, not because he was just talking up the game, but because he was getting really technical and explaining the reasoning behind it and justifying the reasons that I should be excited for this game. And if you're just like me and really wanted to like those other games like Vast, Root, and Oath, but found that they just had a little bit too much overhead, I went through all the designer diaries and gathered up all the different ways that this game is simplified and I think you'll be interested to hear all the different changes that Cole is making with this one or the values that he held as he was designing it. But before I get into that, I guess I should let you know a little bit of the theme on this one. And in this game, each player is going to be playing as their own small faction in a spacefaring universe where players are going to be traveling through the galaxy, growing their faction and transforming and making different moral decisions that can have ripple effects through the entire galaxy. The game does have a narrative, but it doesn't always punish failures because it can put you up into impossible situations where doing well doesn't necessarily mean winning, but losing spectacularly can have you careening into a new opportunity. And yes, this game does have a branching narrative to it where the player's decisions will affect the way that the game unfolds because this is a campaign game. And I know already a lot of you might think, wow, this is just another massive game because most campaign games are ridiculously large, but this one is actually just a one to three game campaign. So you're gonna be completing the entire arc in just one to three games. So even if you don't have a super consistent play group, it's not a huge ask to get them together just one to three times to play the entire campaign. And that's one of the first things that really impressed me with the simplified design. And that's something I'd love to see from more games because it's not always easy to get people together consecutively to play a massive game like Gloomhaven. But instead offering short campaigns that can be repeatedly played and have completely different outcomes and stories, that really seems like something I'd love more designers to explore. And going through the designer diaries, Cole really does a great job of summarizing the sort of mindset he put himself in while he was designing this one. And that was to create a game that immersed the players and didn't break that immersion by requiring them to constantly have to reach to the rule book to try and understand the different nuances or complicated rules that a lot of other games, even those that he designed, do suffer from. 
So instead, this game's going to start with a base set of rules with some randomization at the start of the game, but then it's going to spoon feed you more and more rules as the game goes on so that players don't have to feel overwhelmed trying to learn everything at once. And the same concept is applied to the different factions as well. Instead of all the factions being vastly different, like in Root or Vast, all the factions are going to start very similar to each other, and then you're going to be modifying them yourself as the game goes on, learning the new rules and abilities in bite-sized chunks, but then also choosing your own path because you're not restricted to a subset of abilities limited to your faction. Instead, players will discover and add different abilities that they think will help them, and then include those into their faction's toolset. Players will be gaining opportunities to gain new abilities throughout the game, but these are going to be fairly rare, but also at the end of each chapter, players can also spend any points that they gain in order to upgrade or advance their faction in different ways. And another really interesting aspect of this game is as you end a chapter and start a new one, the time between those chapters represents a large passage of time within the world of the game. And players are going to be drawing a fate card for each of the chapters, and depending on the player's decisions within that chapter, it's going to determine which branch or path that fate card is going to resolve to. And this can alter the rules, the narrative, as well as the state of the game as it moves forward. But now that you know a bit about the tempo of the game and the way it was designed, how do the actual mechanisms work in the game and what is that core mechanism? And the core mechanism in this game did take me off guard because it was not what I was expecting at all because the core mechanism in this game is trick taking. And I wasn't sure exactly how to feel about that at first because anytime a game tries to use a trick taking mechanism, it just ends up feeling like Euchre or your traditional trick taking game with some random theme slapped on top of it. But as I read more and more into this, there's actually quite a few layers that change the way the trick taking works in this game and the different suits that players have will allow players to perform different actions. And each of the cards are also multi use so they can allow you to choose between different options such as battling, moving, building, or performing research. Just like in traditional trick taking, the higher card is more valuable and if you are able to play the highest card for a trick, then that's going to give you the most initiative and you're going to be able to do your actions first. But you may not always want to take that route because the lowered value cards actually allow you to perform additional actions. So even if you don't have the advantage of turn order, there still is a benefit there. And another neat mechanism that is layered on top of all of that is you can actually discard cards in order to boost your initiative value, but that will come at a cost because you won't have those cards later, which means you're essentially throwing away an action. The battles in this game do use a combination of dice and cards, and the attacking player is going to be rolling those dice, and they essentially have three types of outcomes. They can do risky full-on assaults, try to steal something, or try to dislodge the enemy to gain a positional advantage. But you're not going to have complete control over which of those you choose because this is done through dice rolling, but you will have control over which type of dice you put into your dice pool, and each die will have different probabilities of each of those outcomes. So you'll be able to tailor your dice to the types of probabilities that you want for each of those actions. And the research action is the core of what allows players to create their asymmetrical factions because you're going to have a few different sections on your board, each representing a different type of ship and a different type of special unit. Researching tech cards will allow you to upgrade those different areas of your board by putting that research card in the space of whatever was there previously. And this allows players to upgrade their ships for combat, their extractors for gaining resources, or their factories for converting those resources into other more useful resources. And of course, those three special units, which can all do something a little bit different. I'm really excited about this one, and if I haven't guessed enough, there is just one more thing I wanted to mention that just makes me feel really good about this campaign, because with a lot of other campaigns on Kickstarter and GameFound, the offerings that we often see on the campaign pages are just so giant and ridiculously huge with hours and hours of gameplay and tons of miniatures and components, and they're really designed to just sell you more rather than selling you the right amount for the best experience of the game. And for this one, I really feel like it's about the game and trying to create an experience that players can actually get to the table easily to offer the optimal experience with the smallest package possible. And that's a direction I'd like to see more campaigns go on Kickstarter and GameFound because these campaigns aren't supposed to be just about how much we can buy and how much plastic and shelf space we can take up. It'd be really nice to see more humble campaigns. They're just offering a sensible package that makes sense and isn't offering too much more than what we really need. Of course, the option for deluxified components is still really nice, but most campaigns just tend to overdo it, and that's something I'd like to see dialed back a little bit more, especially with the crazy shipping prices and the amount of plastic that it creates for the world, which I think we all agree we have enough of already. Of course, we won't know the exact specifics of this campaign until it launches, but if you are interested in this one like I am, definitely follow along and subscribe to get notified. 
And launching on May 24th, we have 44 BCE, and this plays two to five players and takes about 60 to 150 minutes to play. And this is a political negotiation game where Julius Caesar has just been assassinated and players are competing to become the next ruler of Rome. Players are going to be competing over a series of rounds to gain power and influence, and there's always going to be one player acting as the Imperium Maius, and that's always the player who had the most control at the start of each round. Throughout the game, the other players are kind of working semi-cooperatively against the Imperium Maius to try and gain authority and gain control of those individual fields of power to try and collectively take that player down, but then individually position themselves as the best suitor for the next ruler of Rome. Each round plays over a series of phases, and the first phase is the building phase. And this is where players will be able to build different building tiles around the board, and each section in the board represents a different phase in the game. And each phase is going to allow players to perform different actions, but if you have buildings built in that area of the board during that phase that will give you some special bonuses or additional options during that phase. Buildings can also give you instant one-time effects when you place them as well as grant you victory points at the end of the game. After the building phase, players move into the production phase where every player is going to gain one military, one political, and one social and support cube, which they'll be able to use later in the game. And just like I mentioned, if any players have built buildings in the production phase's space on the board, then they'll be able to perform additional actions here. Players will then move into the enlist phase where they'll be able to buy cards to add to their own personal player board, and this is going to allow certain upgrades for players to manipulate their cubes into different resources and gain more authority and gain more control in different areas and try to manipulate their position of power in the three different areas. But you can only ever have a total of seven cubes and cards, so after the enlist phase you move into the discard phase where players will discard down to that limit of seven. After that, players move into the commit phase for the player who is currently in power and at this phase that player is going to be able to use the cards that they have to convert their resources, gain authority, and manipulate the game state for their favor and then reveal those decisions to all the players. After that players can negotiate freely amongst each other and trade different resources and cards and make certain plans in order to work together and try to stop the person in power. All negotiations are non-binding so just because you fulfill your end of the bargain doesn't mean the other player has to when it comes to them keeping their word. After the players are done negotiating, it then moves into their commit phase where the players will be able to use their own cards to convert resources and gain authority and manipulate the balance of the game, just like the player who is currently in power was able to do in the previous round. The difference here is that this is all done in secret, and then in the following resolution phase, all players reveal the decisions that they made, and a lot of players may be upset to see that the other players did not follow through with their end of the bargain. All the players' decisions are then resolved, and if different players are now in control of the different areas of power, then that single player of power's role is going to shift over to whoever controls the most fields of power, or if there's no single player that controls the most fields of power, then it's going to go to one of those players that has the most authority. After that we move into the cleanup phase and the rounds continue in the same sequence of phases until the end of the game and the number of rounds in a game is dictated by the number of players. Victory points are then totaled up from the different tiles and cards that the players have gained throughout the game, any buildings they've built that also grant them victory points, as well as victory points gained from any remaining coins that have been unspent. The player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins the game. Also launching on May 24th, we have The Breach, and this plays 1-4 to four players and takes about 60-90 to 90 minutes to play, and this is coming from the publisher Ludus Magnus Studio, and the reason I'm pointing that out is because this is actually designed to be a sort of re-implementation or simplified version of another one of their games, and that game is known as Black Rose Wars. And this one's going to be more accessible, have a simpler rule set, and be less epic overall. And I think that's a good thing because we don't need every game to be hugely sprawling and epic with a ton of content and rules overhead. But the theme of this one is quite a bit different. In this one, players are hackers in a cyberspace, and your objective is to spread your viruses inside the database and gather as much information as possible as you're going up against a firewall that's getting stronger and stronger with each round, till eventually players can no longer go up against that firewall and the game ends, and then the player who's collected the most data is going to win the game. 
Each player is going to have an individual player board, and the interesting thing about these boards is that there's three slots for your main abilities. There's going to be a movement, attack, and evasion abilities that players will be able to upgrade their boards with. But then there's also some other actions players can do, like upgrading, configuring, or disconnecting from the cyber world. And there's also going to be some location-specific actions depending on where you are on the main board. The neat thing about the way the actions work in this game is that you're going to have action cubes to perform your various actions, but in order to perform that action, you need to have an action cube in that space on your board. But then each space is connected by an arrow, and some of them have multiple arrows in different directions. And when you perform the action, you have to move the cube along one of those arrows into a new space, which is going to prevent players from repeating the same actions over and over. And you're going to have to decide which actions you think you're going to be performing next, because the availability of those actions is going to be dependent on where you move those cubes. And the game continues like this for a series of rounds of players performing and optimizing their action choices in order to gain the most data, and the player with the most points at the end of the game wins the game. Also launching on May 24th, we have Batman Gotham City Chronicles Season 3, and this plays 2-4 to four players and takes about 60-90 to 90 minutes to play. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one because this is their third campaign. There's a ton of content out there already that you can go and look up how the game plays and what it's all about, but I will give you a quick high level. And if you are a fan of Batman or a fan of miniatures in general, this might be worth backing just for the miniatures. This is going to offer you almost every character you can think of in the Batman world, and also offering those different characters from the different timelines and different areas in the multiverse. And they did not discriminate the characters they included because they also do have a few of the silly ones including Batcow. This is going to be offering you a one versus many scenario based game where one player is going to be playing as all the villains and then you can have a few other players working cooperatively against the villain and they're going to be using a unique player board depending on the character that they're playing as and they might have some starting tools and items depending on their character and then players are going to be spending their energy cubes in order to perform their actions but there is a steep cost if you run out of energy so you don't want to put yourself in a position that your enemy can take advantage of and the enemy player is going to be playing a slightly different game as they're going to be using a different type of board that's going to have a river of cards and they're going to be controlling multiple enemies but also paying an energy cost to activate each of those enemies and the catch here is that each time you activate an enemy it's going to move to the end of the river but then the ones at the start of the river are going to be the cheapest to activate so this player will be incentivized to use the characters that are the furthest to the start of the river but those characters may not always be the most advantageous to use so you may want to pay a little bit extra to activate one further down the line this game already has an insane amount of content and I'm not sure how that's going to translate with today's shipping prices so you might want to take a look at that before you back the campaign and because of that I don't think they're going to be adding too much more to the board game but they are going to be making some tweaks and improvements to the game that they already have and this is something that the community has been asking for for a while because this is a game that has a bad reputation for its rule set and a bad reputation for its iconography and many people that own this game just never get it to the table because of its difficulty to learn and teach to others. Their players. And Monolith is trying to rectify that in this campaign and they've completely rewritten the rulebook to make it a little bit more digestible. We won't know for sure how much of an improvement they've made so if they do provide a PDF version of it and I hope they do I definitely recommend taking a look at it for yourself and seeing if you can make any sense of it. They're also going to be adding a skill sheet to help players better understand the different icons and skills that the different characters have and they're also going to be introducing a new way to play with your solo and co-op modes. And another reason that I don't think they're going to be adding too much more content to the game is because they're also going to be offering a role-playing game in this campaign. So I think that role-playing game is the majority of the reason that they are launching this campaign to begin with, but then they're also going to be offering their previous content with a rewritten rulebook and a few new modes of play. And I hope these new changes really do help because a ton of people paid a lot of money to back this campaign and there's a ton of content and plastic and material made and delivered for this game. And I think it's a little unfortunate how difficult it was to And the quality of the rulebook, in my opinion, is not to the level of quality that you would expect for when paying this much for a game. And if you're going to stack this much content and plastic into a game, I think it's just your due diligence to try to make sure the actual game is sound. But like I said, if you are a Batman fan, it might be worth backing just for the miniatures, but I hope those improvements do allow for more table time.
Also launching on May 24th, we have Bark Avenue, and this plays one to five players and takes about 45 to 60 minutes to play. And this is a competitive route optimization game that utilizes pickup and deliver, where players are each a different dog walker, and you're gonna be walking different dogs with different needs, where some dogs might prefer different lengths of walks or prefer different activities, require a different amount of bathroom breaks, and they might also have different compatibility issues or preferences amongst the other dogs. Players will be moving around the board, trying to gain the most points by fulfilling the different needs of the different dogs the best they can. But you don't want to take too long because if you return the dog to its owner too late, you're going to get a lower payment and you're also not going to get as good of a rating. And having good ratings is what you will use to unlock new abilities like walking more dogs simultaneously, going off leash, or even taking more end of turn actions including more pickups or visiting a pet shop to gain some special items. At the end of the game, the player that was the most successful dog walker wins the game. And launching on May 24th, we have Castleshire, and this plays 2 to 6 players, it takes about 20 to 45 minutes to play, and this is a competitive castle building game where players are each trying to become the most renowned castle builder by building the most valuable rooms. Players are collectively building the same castles at the same time, and there's going to be 12 different rooms within a castle, and each player is going to be starting the game with 12 cards, with each card being associated with the number that matches the room in that castle. And this game has a really interesting mechanism where each player is going to be choosing a card at the start of each round and then simultaneously revealing it and then the highest value of that card is going to get put out on the castle and then the next card played needs to be higher than that value and then each card after that needs to be higher than the card played before it. And the reason that this is an interesting mechanism is because it inherently makes those higher valued cards easier to play which makes them more valuable. But there is also a problem here because you can only ever play one card a single time throughout the entire game. So if you've already played all your high value cards, you're going to have less options in the following round. But you do have a way around that because you're actually playing all the castle cards face down. So no other player actually knows the value of the card that you played. So you could try to be sneaky and put a lower valued card in a high valued space. And hopefully no other player challenges you on that. And you do want to put out as many cards as possible because each card that you put out you get to put one of your worker meeples on it and at the end of the round each of your meeples is going to be worth one point. But after your turn another player can challenge you and you're going to have to reveal that card and if it doesn't match the value of the space that you put it on then you are going to be removing your meeple and the opponent player is going to get to put their meeple there instead. But if you played honestly and your card does match the board then you get to put two meeples out on that card giving you an extra point and you also get to discard one of the cards in your hand to the player that challenged you. That's a really nice way to get rid of your lowered value cards and it also triggers the end of the game sooner because this game's going to end as soon as one player completely runs out of their cards and if you're getting rid of your cards while simultaneously gaining more points it's going to put you in a better position to win the game. A round ends once no more cards can be played on that round or when all players pass and then the next rounds are going to continue in the exact same way where each player is going to choose a card and simultaneously reveal it and then putting the highest value card as the starting card out on the castle board. Once the end of the game is triggered, the player with the most victory points wins the game. I think this game has some really smart design decisions that allow the players to play as risky as they want, but then kind of puts them in a corner because you're trying to get rid of all your cards, but then those lower value cards are much more difficult to get rid of. This game's definitely going to push its players to make some tough and risky decisions at one point or another, and I think that's a really impressive feat considering how simple the rule set is, and to me that shows some elegance in the design. But if you do want to add a little bit more complexity, or if you just want a little bit of variation from game to game, the game does offer a ton of different expansion modules that you can mix and match into your game however you like, and this is going to allow players to have a lot of flexibility with the way that they play this game. Definitely looks like a solid little filler game, and if this one looks interesting to you, I have links in the description below. And launching on May 24th, we have another really exciting campaign because this one is going to be for the Castles of Burgundy, and this is one of the best games ever made. It's ranked 17th overall on Board Game Geek, and it plays 2-4 to four players and takes about 30-90 to 90 minutes to play, and it's no surprise that this one is our pick of the week. But don't look at this page because the new version is going to be much more impressive with brand new artwork, deluxified components, and every expansion included. And if you're not familiar with this game, it's a Euro style game where each player is going to have their own individual player board. And in the center, there's going to be some different hex locations where players will be placing different hexes throughout the game. But you're going to have to start adjacent to your starting castle, which goes in the middle of the board, and then expand from there. 
There's also some different areas on your board to store the tiles you haven't placed yet, your different goods that you've collected, as well as your coins and your dice as well because each player is going to be getting their own set of dice. And the game plays over five phases with each phase having five rounds. And I know this board doesn't look too impressive compared to the other artwork provided on this page, but a lot of the art in this campaign is still concept work and they haven't quite finalized the way that the board looks. So expect these images to update as the campaign goes on. But at the start of each round, there's gonna be five good tiles that are put randomly off to the side of the board. And then each player is gonna be rolling their dice with the player who is currently the first player also rolling a white die. And the only purpose of that white die is to determine where one of those five goods tiles will go out onto the board. Players are also going to randomly draw tiles and put them out on each individual space and that's all you do at the start of the round and then we're going to move into the next phase where players will be able to spend their dice in order to perform different actions and the value of the dice that you rolled is going to dictate what sort of options you have depending on the action that you choose. And the different actions players can choose are to trade one of their dice in order to gain some worker tokens and the worker tokens allow you to modify the value of your dice either increasing it or decreasing that value by one or alternatively players Players can spend two of their silver in order to buy whatever tile they want, or they can sell any goods that they have in their warehouse on their board to gain a silver as well as victory points depending on how many of those goods you've sold. Or instead you can gain a hex from one of the locations that matches the value of your die. And then finally the most interesting one is to use your die in order to place one of those tiles. And this is where the main puzzle of the game comes into play because at the start of the game each player is going to be putting a board into their main player board and this board is going to have limitations on what color of tile you can put there and then also which value of die you need in order to place that tile in that space. So if you have a tile that matches the color of a space on that board and you have a die available to spend as an action that matches the value there and also that space is adjacent to another tile that you've already put on the board, then you do have the option to place that tile. But the fun doesn't stop there because the color of the tile that you placed also allows for the special action that's associated with that color. And these different actions might allow you to gain additional goods, move ahead in the player order, or gain victory points, which can stack depending on which other tiles you already have in your board. And there's also special action tiles that have unique abilities that players will also be competing for. And then after the players have completed their two actions from their two dice, they're going to be re-rolling those dice again with the lead player rolling that white die determining where the next goods tile is going to go. And then the rounds continue like that until the end of the game and the player with the most victory points wins the game. And when I first heard about this campaign, I was pretty quick to roll my eyes because I wasn't too happy with some of the previous Awakened Realms campaigns because I think they do have a tendency to overload their games with too much junk and plastic and components that just don't really add too much value or have any reason to be in the game and a lot of times I think it even detracts from the value because it just makes the box bigger than it needs to be makes it heavier and more expensive to ship and tends to make the game more fiddly just for the sake of having some pretty miniatures or extra plastic that didn't need to be there to begin with or just doesn't even function as good as the original components and when I first saw the size of this box and then also realized that there's multiple boxes in this campaign, it did give me some reasons for concern. But after looking more and more into it, I'm not too upset with the changes that I'm seeing because most of them do add gameplay value. And I'll just go through that whole list of changes and let you know what to expect. And the first one, obviously, is that they are upgrading the artwork for this game, which is really nice because the original Euro game, like many Euro games, doesn't really have the prettiest artwork. And getting a more modern touch, I think, really does add to the experience that the game offers. And the reason that these three tiles look like they have a very different style of artwork is because this is all still very much in the concept phase and I think they're going to leave it up to the community to decide which direction they should go with the artwork. I personally think this one on the left looks a million times better than the other two. I don't know what everyone else thinks but I really hope they go with that style. They're also improving the iconography, making some of the numbers and icons a lot bigger and then having the artwork go right to the edge giving it a really modern look. Not only that, but they're also making the tiles 30% bigger, which does take up more space, but it also makes them easier to handle and easier to see. The game's gonna come with metal coins as well as an insert to store all the components and tiles. And the individual player boards are also gonna be double layered recessed boards where you'll be able to put in your special board in the middle. And then there's gonna be a clear transparent overlay that you can put over top of it, which has a hex pattern, which will allow players to easily slot in their different tiles as they're placing them throughout the game. So they are going a little bit of an extra mile here with some extra engineering of these recessed boards. 
Not only that, but there's also spaces to hold your dice and the other components that you'll have throughout the game. And there's gonna be a ton of those double-sided duchy boards that go into your player boards, giving a lot of variety for players to choose from, from game to game. They're gonna be giving you a castle miniature in place of the castle tile that goes into the center of your board. And I really don't mind this upgrade. It's just one miniature that goes in the center of your board. It's nothing too crazy. And it does add a little bit of a fun centerpiece for each player to have on their board. The thing that I don't get is why they are including 16 of these miniatures in the box. But then they're using the exact same sculpt for all of them. I mean, it'd be really nice if there was at least four different castles so each player could have their own unique castle. I mean, I personally would only want four of these miniatures total, but if that's the case, and even if it wasn't, I still think that there should be at least four different castle sculpts so that each player does have a different sculpt of their own. But we'll see what they unlock in the stretch goals. I don't really want to see any more added to this game, but if they could improve on the sculpts that they already have, I think that'd be a big improvement. And finally, this campaign will be including all the expansions as well and each of the expansions will also have upgraded artwork and components just like the core game. A lot of this still is work in progress so make sure to stay tuned to the campaign if you want to see exactly what each of these expansions will look like as its final product. And by final I mean completely subject to change by the time it actually ships. But they are also offering a money back guarantee. Of course that likely doesn't include shipping and they are including shipping rates. The gameplay all-in pledge that they have on the campaign now doesn't look like a terrible price for what you're getting, especially considering that this is one of the greatest games of all time. And I'm happy to say that I am interested in this one and I don't see too many red flags yet, aside from those 16 castles, and I don't really mind if they do end up adding a bunch of non-essential content to this campaign. I'm not a huge fan of creating more junk and plastic for this world, but as long as it's optional and not paywalling you for the gameplay content, then I don't have any problem with providing more options to the backers to choose from. But I'm excited to learn more and I hope this is a campaign that I can back and add to my collection because this is a really beautiful version of a really excellent game. And launching on May 26th, we have Hacktivity, and this plays one to four players, takes about 40 to 60 minutes to play. And this is a cooperative scenario based campaign card game where players are trying to defeat viruses in the cyber world. Players are going to be playing as different asymmetrical characters, each with their own set of unique cards. Each turn, players will be able to draw cards from their hand or from the virus deck. Drawn virus cards will go into the antivirus interface, which will allow players to start attacking that virus and trying to defeat them. But drawing a virus can have some random effects which can cause damage to the player, other viruses, or even increase interference. And if the interference gets too high or if one of the player loses all their health then the players lose the game. This means that you probably don't want to be drawing the virus cards too quickly but you also don't want to be drawing your own character cards too quickly because they are one-time use and if you're drawing them too frequently that means you're not going to be getting as much out of those cards. But when you do load viruses into the antivirus interface, that will allow players to play their character cards and abilities to attack and deactivate those viruses. And to do this, you can attack viruses directly, attack multiple viruses, or even chain viruses together to destroy them in one fell swoop. Character cards are also dual use, offering you a basic ability, but then also a more powerful ability that usually comes at the cost in the form of your health or some other negative consequence. And if players can defeat all the viruses before one of the endgame triggers causes them to lose the game, then they win the game. And those are all the campaigns I have for you this week, but don't leave yet because we have a couple of giveaways to announce. And the first one is going to be for Hunters of the Lost Creatures, the card game. And this is a card game where players are going to be trying to collect different creatures of different values in order to create different combos and score victory points depending on the combos and color variations that they're able to acquire. And the way this game works is that each player is going to have four hunters of each of the four colors. And then there's going to be four different animals revealed each round that are also in four different colors. Players will then each choose one of the hunters from their hand and then simultaneous reveal Players will then choose one of the hunters from their hand and then simultaneously reveal those cards. And then players will then get the animal that matches the color of their hunter. The catch here is that if two or more players play the same color, then that frightens the animal and none of the players get that colored animal. There's also some special ability cards that players could use to their advantage or to mess with the rules of the game. At the end of the game, players are going to be scoring points for each of their cards and sets of cards in the various different ways. And then the player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins the game. 
And to enter this giveaway, all you have to do is check out the link to our Discord in the description below, and check out the giveaways channel and click the little emoji underneath the comment for that giveaway, and that will get you automatically entered in the giveaway, which will be drawn at the end of eight days. And the next giveaway we have is for a pledge for Grab Your Breakfast, and this is a set collection game where players are trying to collect different sets of cards in order to gain victory points. And just like in Sushi Go, the cards in this game define the sets that you need in order to make that card valuable. But the catch here is that you have to spend a card in your hand matching that card in order to draw it from the tableau. But then also you can only grab cards from the leftmost side of a row or the rightmost side of the row. Each space in the tableau also has a stack of two cards, so there's always going to be one card hidden at the start of the game that will get revealed as soon as that top card is taken, so there's always going to be a little bit of a surprise there as well. Once all the cards are taken, players add up their score depending on the sets of cards that they manage to get, and then the player with the most victory points wins the game. And this giveaway is for the regular breakfast pledge, which comes with the core game and all unlocked stretch goals. And to enter this giveaway, same thing, just head over to the Discord in the description below, check out the giveaways channel, and click the little emoji underneath the post. Good luck in the giveaways, but now let's go ahead and draw the winners for last week's giveaway. And the first two giveaways were for IT Startup, Office Lockdown, and Pirates Dragon's Treasure, and these were both offered on the Discord, so if you entered those last week, be sure to go ahead and check out the Discord and see if your name was drawn. But then here on YouTube, we ran the epic and tiny giveaway for Tiny Epic Vikings. And all you had to do to enter that giveaway was leave a comment over on that video. And I use this fancy application here to draw a winner from those comments. And then all these extra names down here are bonus entries for my Patreon subscribers. If you want to help support the channel and make all these efforts just a little bit more sustainable for me, it's definitely not a requirement, but if these videos do provide some amount of value and you can't afford it, it definitely makes a difference for me and I truly do appreciate it. If not, I still really appreciate you watching these videos. And whether you like and subscribe or do any of that stuff, it's definitely still not a requirement but if you want to help the channel grow and get a little bit more attention, it is a free way that you can help the channel. But let's get to the good stuff here and draw the winner. And I do need to make one correction here because this is actually for Tiny Epic Dungeons. I keep messing that up because Tiny Epic Vikings is on Kickstarter now, and this is provided by Gameland Games, but they wanted to offer something that they could ship out immediately. And the lucky winner is... And I accidentally closed the tab, but we did catch that on video. So congratulations, Guillaume Rosolet. And I will reach out to you and let you know that you won yourself a copy of Tiny Epic Dungeons. And the next giveaway we had was for a pledge for Damask, which you can go ahead and check out on GameFound now. And a draw winner will do the exact same thing. So let's go ahead and draw those comments. And draw the winner. And the winner is... Luke L. And this is another one of our Patreon subscribers, so congratulations Luke. I'll reach out to you and let you know you won yourself a pledge for Damask. And that's everything I have for you this week, and I was running a little bit behind this week, so it is pretty late right now, so I'm probably not going to get in any editing tonight. I should probably grab some sleep. So I'll do all my editing in the morning, which means this will probably be going up a little bit later. But I guess by the time that you see this, you already know that, but at least now you know why. I also did already film my video for what I backed in March, which I'm also late on because that should have went out last month. And I should also be filming the video for what I backed in April, which I will try to also get out real soon. The YouTube algorithm's probably going to hate me after this month, but until next time, keep that shelf cluttered and the table full.